Welcome back. And on the second part of today's program, we have Gordon Chan. Gordon, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Pleased to be here. Absolutely. And we've finished our walk. Yeah. How huge was it for you as a survivor thriver? Oh, it was, it was really big for me. I mean, I was so excited to, and, you know, felt very privileged to be even asked this, you know, many months ago to be a, a part of the whole project. Mm. And uh, initially I thought to myself, well, this is, you know, after uh, being cured from cancer, it was a challenge. And I thought, I'll, I'll accept this challenge. And I guess my, as I walked, my thoughts changed about the whole thing. Initially it was a personal thing, but as I got a lot of uh, phone calls and emails of encouragement, I realised then that I was actually walking for other people at the hospital, that I, my fellow colleagues that were supporting me. I was also walking for other cancer survivors, and I mm -hmm. even got messages from cancer uh, people that uh, had people die of cancer they knew. And the final one that really moved me a bit more was my own cousin in San Francisco who was uh, being treated for breast cancer uh, at the moment, and she said that I was walking for her as well. And uh, that, that kept me going in the first couple of sections, actually. Wow. Now you also work for Austin Health, don't you? Yes, I'm the head of radio pharmacy there. Um, I've, I'm a, a trained pharmacist, but I specialise in radioactive drugs from about 1980 and I work in the nuclear medicine and pet centre. And uh, we actually, I had my cancer in 2003 when I was diagnosed. And um, we got a new PET CT camera in and I was actually the first patient that was scanned on that camera with my own radioactive FDG, which is like a radioactive sugar, which accumulates in cancer cells just, and that was just to see the, sp if it had the spread of the disease in my body. Mm. Okay, you mentioned PET, what's that? Positron emission tomography. Which means? Uh, well, you get injected with different radioactive compounds which are labelled with a, um, a, ra a radioactive nuclei, nuclei which is called a positron emitter and these positron emitters um, will annihilate with a, an electron and form the gamma rays which is what you see with a camera and you can label these things to various compounds it can be just things like oxygen 15, which is um, similar to oxygen 16 you breathe, so we can label water or um, oxygen and then look at, the, how you, we did brain activation studies with that one, say, so we can ask you early studies, was clench your right fist, see which part of your brain lights up. We do different right. research studies. Like radioactive sugar, which is the fluorodoxy glucose, as I said, glucose is used in all your cells, and uh, this way, um, all your cancer cells will take up more of the sugar, so we can see, locate cancer cells with this uh, compound. And there's other cells which look at different receptor compounds. We do a lot of uh, neurological studies, you know, to do with dementia, so like uh, Alzheimer's disease and things like that. Okay. Well, when did you start with uh, the Austin Hospital? What year? Oh, that was back in 1980 or earlier than 80, I think. I've been there nearly 30 years now. Wow, yeah. you're a hugely loyal person, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I've had my own businesses outside as well, but I've, okay. I've essentially stayed at the Austin as well. Alrighty, how was it for you then, being part of the Austin Hospital, mm. and then you get diagnosed with cancer? Yes. Uh, so you, bec uh, you become a patient of your own... That's right, that was an unusual feeling at first because, um, you know, when, I, when you work in a centre like that, you think you know what's going on. I'm a, mm. Being a pharmacist first, I dispense a lot of the side of any cancer drugs, cytotoxic drugs, and I thought oh, I knew all the side effects and things. But in actual fact, um, when you first go to the cancer centre and you, suddenly they're going to start infusing the cytotoxic drugs into you, which is yeah. you know, essentially poison, you're poisoning your body. When you see the stuff coming down the line, you're still not sure. And, um, but you know, at the end it was, uh, it was all right, but I had a lot of side effects which aren't even listed, so I learned a lot more about the uh, side effects of the drugs, I think. And you, get, you do get very sick. You feel, a bit, you feel a bit more compassion for the patients that have to undergo the chemotherapy. But one thing I noticed working there is um, the staff that there, I knew the staff sort of thing, and um, I just saw the compassion of the nursing staff. They were, you know, they, they, you can see they could have a hard day. Not all cancer patients are easier to treat. You know, mm -hmm. some are a bit more ha harder than others, and they get a bit more aggressive sometimes. And, and I could see that, you know, they can get attached to cancer patients, and not all of them make it. And you can see they're always pleasant, compassionate, and you can see them going back to the, behind the office, you can see how tired some of them, and just, just the compassion shown with the nursing staff was fantastic. But in addition to that, I, I could understand that you needed something like Olivia's Wellness Centre, because mm. the thing is, when you're in a waiting room, which the waiting room is no bigger than the sort of buses we've been travelling on, and you're sitting there, and I'm not saying it's a factory, but you, you have to sit there and just look at each other, and, and then it wasn't a very conducive atmosphere for, you know, being for sick people, really. And then and even afterwards. So it would be good to have a wellness centre to sit there to, to contemplate, you know, things, to just meditate, to talk to um, psychologists or things like that. And then even afterwards to collect your thoughts before you go home to see your family, you know, it would be a great, great place to just do the same thing. And 
in addition to that, I found that my, I guess your family members, your partners, feel very helpless in these situations, and even they would benefit from the wellness centre. Mm -hmm. What sort of form of cancer did you have? I had testicular cancer, which is the mm -hmm. same form that um, you know the famous Lance Armstrong had, the, mm -hmm. the uh, winner of the bicycle um, races in uh, uh, in France. And testicular cancer is one of those cancers which, um, prior to Lance Armstrong, was a death sentence. You know, there was many sports stars in Australia that have died from uh, testicular cancer. But there's been a lot of research since Lance Armstrong, and, and it's got to the stage now that it's 98% success rate. To treat it. It's one of the more curable cancers. Okay. Having said that, it's the most common form of uh, solid, solid malignancy in 15 to 35 year old males. Okay. I'm, um, I was 49 when I got it, but you still got a 1 in 250 chance of getting it to the age 65. But because it's, it is curable, it's, it's, um, it's one of those which I, I, when I, as I said, working in it, statistically I thought, well, I got a good chance. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't as worried. I just, if it doesn't work, I, I can't do much about it. But I've got a very good chance. It's one of those things I ignored the symptoms early. What are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms of testicular cancer could be that you, you could have a sore testicle or, you know, a swollen testicle. It mm -hmm. could be, feel lumpy due to the, the vesicles um, swell, swelling up. Or it could even be shrink, a smaller testicle which shrinks if it's later on and no pain. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you have abnormal symptoms, if, you, if your testicle feels abnormal, you should get it checked out straight away. Mm -hmm. I ignored the symptoms. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I, I thought, because it was tender, I just thought I was having too much sex. I remember you saying I, I that. I told my wife that, and I said, after a couple of weeks it died, and I said, oh, that's what it was. Yep. But in actual fact, I was undergoing something else at the hospital for another trial, and an ultrasound picked that they had a, a larger lymph node, and that's how we, after biopsy, confirmed the diagnosis of the cancer. Okay. Well, what would you say to most men, though, then? Because men, traditionally, for whatever the reason, seem reluctant to do anything about any abnormality in their body, what would you now say to That's men? That's right. Well, men, women are more attuned to their body and th you know, they're used to seeing doctors from an early age and things. Mm. But with men, and you've got to understand things like, like prostate cancer, for instance, is you, many men die of prostate cancer, women die of breast cancer each year. Mm. And for men, really, I, I know we all feel that we're, you know, we're running the household, we've got to always feel strong, look strong and things. But basically, all I can say is that if you've got something that's abnormal, mm -hmm. it's better to check it early than late. And if it's nothing, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But if it is something, it's, you've got, but your chances increase immeasurably if you get something early. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, we'll get on to the, the Great Walk, yeah. which finished yesterday. Yeah. How was the whole experience for you? As, you know, as I said, it, it was an incredible journey. Mm. It, it's, it was one of those things which will, it, it's, will never be able to be repeated. Even if you try to do the same thing again, you couldn't do it. One, I think a lot of areas and places were opened up to us which we'll never be able to do on our own. But two, just the people we did it with. Mm. The, you know, we did it with, you know, with uh, cancer survivors like myself. We did it with normal people. And we did it with celebrities and, you know, and sports stars and things who all came and we had this camaraderie between us, which as a group, very easy to talk. But everyone was very open. And as has been probably said by other people, it was a forum where everyone could... Uh, they open up and tell their own stories. Everyone had their own story. Each story is just as important as each other's. Everyone, you know, had their own stories to tell. And even if they didn't have cancer like some of these, they, they were touched by cancer by very close, really, could have been their own parents or uh, brothers and sisters. And um, I found it was a very emotional experience because of that. Um, but because of the areas that we visited, it was a very spiritual and um, cultural experience in China as well, which was... I'm a third generation Australian born Chinese, so it was the first time I'd ever been to mainland China. Okay. So to me, it was an emotional thing. It's one of those things where you go back to your roots, you know, to where your ancestors were from. And that's why I found it very spiritual and cultural as well. Okay, well, we'll take a break mm. and we'll come back and find out more about Gordon's return to the land of his ancestors. Stay with us.